Moderate Income Housing Act. Uh, Representative Shelby Maldonado. Present. Representative Michael Morin. Present. House Minority Whip Blake Felipe. Carol Ventura. Uh, David Caldwell. Present. Juliana Berry King. Present. Emily Friedman. Present. Leanne Byrne. Here. Linda Weisinger. Present. Mayor Lisa Baldelli Hunt. Here. Melina Lodge. Uh, David Salvatore. Present. And Annette Bourne. Here. Okay, we do have a quorum, Madam Chair. Thank you. I uh, just want to begin our session today just welcoming Emily Friedman, Director of Community Development, Department of Planning and Development in Providence. She's replacing Kristen Dart. Welcome, Emily. The second part of this, before we begin on our agenda, you will notice you will have a copy of the extension of this Housing Commission. So we're extending the life of the commission from February 11, 2017 to the, third, the May 30th, 2017 and should expire July 30th, 2017. And you should have a copy there for you all. So let's begin. We're gonna have David Codwell, president of Rhode Island Builders Association, come up and uh, be able to share your information with the commission. All right, good afternoon, Madam Chairwoman and members of the committee. And I'm on this side of the fence today, and I will be brief. I'd like to make a couple of key points here. If you have this little map ahead of you, what we're going to talk about very briefly at the wave top view is some of the costs that make housing expensive in the Northeast, with specific attention to Rhode Island, and what some of those barriers are within the market itself that make it unable for the private sector to produce affordable housing. So a couple of key things. If you look at map, I like my colored pictures. It's a Marine Corps thing. Up in the Northeast, we have less production builders than anywhere else in the country. So we're, when they say custom homes, that tends to be smaller, local, traditional operators rather than big multinational corporations. So the further west you go, the more economy of scale you have, the larger subdivisions. We've probably all seen those. Second one, you're going to find that the price of a lot in the Northeast is about 100,000 bucks. The further west and south you go, you're gonna see those numbers drop to 50 or $30,000. These are important inputs because the cost of the lumber, the bricks, the sticks, and the labor is relatively, relatively consistent across the country, you know, small variables. Bottom one's pretty interesting. It says New England, the average size lot for a spec home is about a half acre. But again, the further west you go, Further south you go, you're going to find quarter acre, you know, sixth of an acre lots. I lived in San Diego for 10 years. And if you go out west, you're going to find high density development surrounded by large open spaces in a lot of these places. So counterintuitively, the states of more land, a lot more land, often have those smaller lots. A lot of that's driven by one market, two, it's a lot less expensive to put in your infrastructure, your road, your water, your sewer, your utilities to make the money. These are three things here that in the aggregate start to compile to make housing prohibitively expensive up here in Rhode Island. Page two, you're gonna see where Rhode Island and the cost of permits and delays, the m most difficult market to be permitted in America. This is a Wall Street Journal article from July of last year. The most difficult market to be permitted, oops, sorry. Uh, I forgot to keep that moving along. Most difficult market to obtain a permit would be the metro New York region. The third most difficult market to obtain a permit would be the San Francisco Bay region. I've kind of grouped Long Island and New York together with Oakland and San Francisco, but number two right in the middle is Providence, Rhode Island. So you've seen some good data from that. The Wharton School of Business would say it's hard to get permits in this state. It, it, it just takes a long time. Okay, so you're going to see how that delays things. And you've probably heard the term time is money. But time is risk. You get involved with these projects and you have a lot of uncertainty and unknowns. That happens both in the private sector as well as the Rhode Island housing and the nonprofit sector. We experience the same exact problem. 
the next uh, scrolling down here, you're going to see another Wall Street Journal article, the fees that inflate housing costs. So as you're going to see throughout the country right now, you've seen in more and more uh, municipalities and states looking to the developer for cost of infrastructure. We've been doing that longer in the Northeast than anywhere else in the country. So you're seeing impact fees. Uh, importantly out of this, though, is you're going to find that the cost of new constructions, 32 to 38 percent more than existing homes. And that gap is widening. It's called the Replacement Cost Value of Housing Index. So your builders are competing with existing homes to a certain extent. We already have a shortage of existing homes and housing in this state. And what it costs to build new is getting further and further apart in that gap. So that's another thing that you'll see um, quotes in here from people in, I think it's Georgia, says, I don't build affordable houses anymore. You know, my own family business, when my father started, he built capes and ranches that are often unfinished up in the late 60s and early 70s, modest houses. And now we're a luxury home builder because that's where the money is. We build a lot of beautiful coastal homes, and we don't build affordable housing anymore. We tried, we did a few, but there's no money in it, so we just don't do it. That's what the market dictates. You'll see that as you go through a permanent process, you're going to see how much you spend, and once you get into it, it's rather a frightening amount from my perspective, but a surprising amount from a lot of people who don't know the economics of what the building actually are. The last page is an article I like from the journal last July. This is Rhode Island is last in the nation in permits per capita, uh, almost half what the next last state was with Illinois. You know, we're producing about 1,000 permits a year. I've got lots of data and graphs that we could definitely get into at a later date, but we are hard to build, expensive to build, it takes a long time to build, and we have a housing shortage, but yet we're still not producing anywhere near the amount of housing we need. Rhode Island housing is projected into a no-growth scenario 3,500 units a year is what we need. I would say to get back to a reasonably healthy par market, we really need about 5,000 units in this state. Yeah, it would be nice to have a little more than that, but right now you're about 1,000. So the deficit continues to grow. For those of us in the rental market can tell you, rental market's tight. Rents are going up. There's no new production of rental housing, very limited, and they're not nearly enough. So. I'll conclude with those wave top, if you take a little from today, our regulatory costs are high, our land use policies are out of step with providing affordable housing. We want large lots, even though we're ostensibly the second most densely populated state in America. We want everybody to be on large lots, $100,000 costs. We want long permit times and a lot of fees. So what you can see here is we've driven a market in Rhode Island that's to me, you know, luxury home market, really good. A lot of people want to live in Rhode Island that don't actually live here. They actually bring lots of money and live here, and we have some subsidized affordable. But the market right now is not able to produce the housing that the market demands. And where in that distortion lies is a major focus of what this committee, I hope, can help shed some light on. And I'd be welcome to take any questions if anybody has some. Thank you, David. Thank any you. Any questions? Ma'am? Yes. Hi. Hello. Um, so just a couple of questions. So when you're talking about the difficulty in providing for affordable single-family homes, um, you're talking about affordable with a small a, right, non-subsidized affordable, the kind of homes that you said your dad built in the 70s, small ranches, capes. To, from my perspective, there's no difference between an affordable classified house and a non-affordable house if it's the same house, the same brick sticks lot. It's the same structure and the same cost, whether it's classified affordable or not. I, 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 I just wanted to clarify. So in order for you as a, you know, a private developer to build the kind of stock, let's say a $200,000 single family home, you know, without a government subsidy attached to it, what kind of densities would you need um, and infrastructure would you need to provide that in some of our communities that are, you know, lacking that kind of stock? Sure. You would require 
with that, that price point, you're going to need to get down to those small lots. You might have to get into attached housing, which is elsewhere in the country. You're going to need no septic systems, no, or you're going to need community septic systems, utility connections. You're going to have to get rid of your impact fees, um, uh, things of that nature. But, yes, density in the lots, infrastructure has to be either provided by the municipality or state, some capacity, or shared throughout a population where it makes it economical. Definitely get rid of the impact fees, and those would be the three things I'd look to right off the bat. But it basically comes down to some variant of the density where you need to be. So maybe 8 to 12 per acre or 16 to 20 per acre if we're talking about attached or multifamily condos kind of? Yes. Great. Thank you. At that price point, yes. Thank you. Thank you, David. Representative? Thank you. Oh, just one question. Um, Single-family homes versus rental units, are they the same obstacles? I would say they're both difficult. Rental units are almost impossible in many municipalities because they will take – I'll give you a quick example. Uh, North Kingstown, where we do most of our work, uh, a five-acre parcel of property, they will require a village residential area for 20000 per unit. However – they will put a groundwater overlay district on it. So the zoning conflicts with a self-imposed municipal regulation, which no one has yet to figure out what the basis for that actually is other than to prevent development. So these are what I call the exclusionary zoning policies that have evolved over about 40 years in Rhode Island. So on that two-acre parcel, they'll allow a one single house. That house could have eight bedrooms in it, septic system. That's about max. But on that two-acre parcel, they require a four-acre parcel to have a duplex. So I've asked recently, well, why can't we, the primary constraint being wastewater. So how about if we had eight one-bedroom apartments instead of one eight-bedroom house that I can have by right? Well, you can't have that. Why not? Well, because we have a, it's, you know, right on Post Road, we have a huge demand in South County where I live and work for age-appropriate housing. No one can answer that. They say, well, that's the way it is. So I would say single family is tough, but the rental uh, requirements for multifamily are really tough. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, David. Yes, Barbara. Um, to be clear, is the challenge on the rental side, is part of the challenge on the rental side, the lack of um, the sort of by right multifamily zoning. Um, I mean, obviously the density is part of the problem, um, but is the do you find a lot of places don't allow the multifamily by right, and is that uh, does that add to the permitting time or the requirements in terms of being able to move projects like that ahead? A lot of the zoning by right in in, uh, in South County would be if your single family is X lot size. Multi-family for a duplex would be two times X, three-family would be three times X, and four-family would be four times X. There's no logical correlation to that land use per the density required by the occupants of the building. That doesn't make sense. It doesn't happen elsewhere. It's just the convention that has evolved in Rhode Island over about 40 years by the municipalities not wanting rental housing. That was basically the way that that developed. And that was the way they developed the laws. So, yes, it is very difficult to build multifamily in uh, specifically your suburban communities. Thank you, David. Any other questions? Okay. Thanks, David. Next, we will have Elise Peer, tax assessor for the city of Woonsocket. Come right up. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Elise Perry. I'm the city assessor for Woonsocket. Um, I put together a presentation today to talk about the impacts of um, low income house, low and moderate income housing in Woonsocket. Um, not talking so much about single family units, but more so the larger scale development programs where there may be a hundred or so units per building. Um, 
Here currently are the low-income housing laws um, that apply to me and my office and um, just a summary of the requirements. Uh, these properties have to have um, COs issued after 1995 and then undergo substantial rehab um, according to HUD. Um, based on a recent court case, um, the HUD definition the summary, again, um, as follows. It's a residential project, so it can't be a mixed-use um, commercial residential dwelling. Um, it must have 17550 in rehab costs per unit. Um, each state has a high cost factor that's associated, um, and it equates to 17000 in rehab course, costs. Um, in addition to that, there has to be recorded rent restrictions. So on the deed of the property, it will say, you know, the rents are restricted for, say, a 20, 25-year period. Um, the current projects in Woonsocket, um, it's, I think, a total of 48 parcels, um, and there are 3,000, just over 3,000 total units in our city. Um, when we apply the 8% taxation, which was discussed previously, um, you're taking 8% of their gross revenues each year, um, and that is their tax liability to the community. Um, so Woonsocket, as of last year, received just about $300,000 in revenue from these projects, whereas the true tax of any other um, large uh, development um, would have been about a million dollars. Um, so we are taking a significant loss in the revenues to the city. Um, the taxes paid by these 8% properties represent 1% of their tax assessed value. Um, it's like saying you have a home for half a million dollars and you're only responsible for paying 5000 to the community. Um, there's been talk and we get calls constantly about um, proposed projects in our community. Um, recently, an investor called from California um, about a development that currently has 117 units in it. Um, it does currently pay 100% taxation, um, and the city would be set to lose about $88,000. Um, my question is, you know, taking on the um, affordable housing, which, of course, every community should have affordable housing, and there is a demand or need for it. Um, my primary focus is on, at the end of the year, if this project were to come on, um, one socket would get pushed to having 16, over just over 16% of affordable housing, um, and I know the goal is 10%, um, but where does that $88,000 go to? Um, we have to shift it to our primary, you know, single family, two family homeowners that are not rent restricted. Um, talking about the 8% in the true tax, uh, I'm just going to do a comparison. I used some data from Housing Works Rhode Island and also um, HUD guidelines. So each year when a property is applying for their 8% taxation to a municipality, they actually submit an application, report their rents, and included in them, I think it's a HUD 9253 form. Um, Rhode Island Housing actually signs off on these forms each year, but it shows the amount of rent they are set to receive per unit. Um, last year, again, these are last year certified numbers, the two-bedroom unit in Woonsocket was receiving 1192 a month uh, per unit. Um, in looking at market data based on sales, income information supported or provided to our city, and again, looking at housing works, um, the average two-family Woonsocket apartment yields 983 a month. This number doesn't take into consideration our um, vacancy rates, um, which on average it's 15%, um, but that's not taking into account the bank-owned properties that are just completely vacant and not being utilized. Um, so in an attempt to maintain occupancy, a lot of landlords that have come into the city say, you know, I have to offer utilities. I have to say anything to keep a tenant occupying my house um, just so they can afford the taxes. Um, the effective rental income to a landlord in one socket is about 836 a month. When comparing that to the guidelines and the rent getting uh, rent provided for the restricted units, you're seeing that the restricted units are getting a guarantee, and there's no vacancies reported. Um, there's one project that had a vacancy in one socket, but it was for two months. Um, so, of course, the need is there. However, they're not dealing with the vacancies like a struggling landlord would be. Um, so they're receiving these rents that are 40% higher, but yet their tax liability is actually 70% lower. So there's actually a disincentive for our landlords in the community um, where they can't make ends meet. And again, every time a new project like this comes on, their burden, unfortunately, gets greater. Um, I just discussed this. 
I know there were quite a few bills introduced last year, and I'm pretty sure that was the reason for the creation of this um, committee. Um, and just looking at a few of the bills, it seems like um, a few of them mimicked each other and had similar goals and um, one that I mentioned on here talks about if a community has achieved the 10% um, housing stock, we shouldn't be required to just accept any other projects to come on that would be eligible for this alternative tax. So it's not to say that we wouldn't accept, all, obviously, affordable housing in our community, but to apply this taxation to them, um, I believe is the intent to kind of push that aside. Um, right now, the city of Woonsocket has 15.9% affordable housing. Um, nearly 6% more than the goal. This grid is probably difficult to see, um, but it does show all the communities in Rhode Island and the percentages of affordable housing in each community. There is obviously a clear inequity in the distribution of the affordable units. Um, just to give you an example, um, Warwick, for instance, has almost four times the amount of parcels as Woonsocket. Um, I think there's just 40, 40,000, 44,000 around there in Warwick, whereas Woonsocket only has 11,000 parcels. But if you look at the total counts of affordable units, Woonsocket has 3,000 and Warwick is at 2,000. So when something four times the size has less affordable, affordable units, you think maybe we should apply them more equitably across um, or the distribution of these units should be more widespread. Um, I truly feel that the the burden as all, not the burden but the the goal of having ten percent should be shared by all municipalities, not just viewed on a state level so although as a state as a whole we 're reaching eight um, percent of affordable units, you have a community um, let 's take situate that doesn 't even have one percent um, so in summary, um, each time a property claims the 8% taxation in our city, 70% um, of the tax revenue is lost and has to be shifted elsewhere. Um, preventing additional properties from claiming the 8% would obviously be beneficial to our existing constituents. Um, we're doing a lot of work in Winsocket to alleviate the burden that's on them already. Um, and again, we don't want to shift more of a burden onto them. Um, but instead look at the affordable units that we have and hopefully spread them throughout each community in Rhode Island. Thank you, Elise. Any questions? Yes. Hi. How are you? Good, how are you? Good. Um, so the question, I guess I, I have two questions, is um, given that you're reporting that there are no vacancies of units, have you done any assessment as to the actual need within your community because you're claiming that 16.5% is... Right. So I was just basing my data on the annual reporting that we get from um, the applicants claiming the 8%. Um, not all of the affordable units claim the 8% taxation, um, but the ones that are claiming the 8%, there was a vacancy in one for a couple of months. Correct. Um, but your argument is that you're carrying too much of the, the market share. But if, in mm -hmm. fact, your market required more units, say 25% right. of your population required affordable I guess my housing. argument would be that if you were to go rent an apartment um, from a landlord or, I mean, we have plenty of vacancies throughout the city, um, the, the market rent is actually less than the subsidized rent. So if there were more units that came on, say, an owner applied to, I'm not sure of the actual term that they'd apply for it, but to receive Section 8, say, or something like that, um, I believe they could do that through another, a landlord instead of a huge development that's a huge part of our okay. um, tax burden. Which brings me to my second question. The 1192 that you cite yes. here, is that based on Section 8? That was based on, it came from Rhode Island Housing last year, so I believe that was the amount that they were funding or providing based on a two-family, a uh, two-bedroom unit last year. So, I mean, I think it's sub substantially higher than if you're looking at a low-income tax credit project for a two-bedroom unit, the rent would be about $660 right. after your utility calculation. Mm -hmm. And on... Um, a development looking at 60% AMI as the income restriction, you're looking at about 830. Right. So that's significantly This is lower. all just specific to one socket. So these are the numbers that were reported. Those numbers are specific to one socket as well. 
Okay. So I'm just wondering, Section yeah. 8 rent would pay higher than a low-income tax right. credit property. Right. And so I'm just questioning what the 1192 represents because you have a broad mix of housing types mm-hmm. within one socket, and so one number wouldn't capture It that. was the majority of the housing that was reported under the 8%. So again, I don't know that they're all, they're not all claiming the 8%, you know what I mean? So I was only looking at the 8% properties. But it would seem unfair to then penalize somebody who's collecting perhaps half the rent. Um, would it penalize who? In trying to create a higher tax burden for somebody who is, if a developer is only collecting 660 in rent. Of course, right. And you're proposing that it be on assessed value. The unit may in fact be assessed exactly mm-hmm. the same, but the rent that's allowed would be. So if there are rent restrictions, um, I'll go back to, I worked in Providence quite a few years ago and prior to the 8% being introduced and obviously spreading the way it has, um, if there was a rent restriction on the deed, you can't legally turn around and sell that property over a certain percentage. We assess those properties in accordance with their deed restrictions. So it could be two identical houses and one has a rent restriction on it and one doesn't. They will have two different assessed values. Correct, but we're talking about so that comparing two different affordable units side by side. And so how do you make the distinction for units that have a different right. income target if the rent That's can what be I'm higher? saying. If you're not basing it on the 8% taxation, that would be considered in the assessment. So that would lower their tax burden. Do you know what I mean? If, they're, if they can Andrews, only get yeah. 600 and this one can get 1,200, their total assessed value would be different. Therefore, their tax liability would be different. Correct. I'm pointing out the discrepancy between what somebody may be collecting of 660 versus the 1192. So you're pinpointing perhaps a Section 8 development, which mm-hmm. may not be representative of all the units that are in one socket. Correct. Okay. Correct. Yes. I just want to be clear I am because this is talking very... about 8%, yes. No, 8% in Section 8 would be different. So The 8% taxation properties that were reported last year to our community, those are the numbers I used. I did not use a 8% or Section 8 housing. But those would be eligible for Section... For, if they applied uh, for the 8%, okay. yes. So like I said, there are projects that may be paying... You know, there's one down the street that's a subsidized housing, but and there's many units in there. They do not qualify... They do not apply for the 8% taxation. They pay full tax. Okay. Thank you, Ellie. Any more questions? Um, yes. Just would the commission be able to get... Uh, the spreadsheet that refers to the 3,053 housing units whereby you receive $290,000 versus the Mm million 5,000 that you would suggest they are valued at? So the the 3,000 total units um, that was reported on the housing works, but I have a spreadsheet internally, again, of all the parcels that are receiving or applying for the 8% taxation. And you have what their gross rents are, whether they pay the 8%, Mm -hmm. and what their their assessed value, value. right, so that we'd be able to compare the differential between those two. Mm -hmm. That would be very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Yes, ma'am. So thank you, Elise, for your presentation. I think it's very informative. And I'd just like to comment on um, something that the young lady in the front said here. I'm sorry, I don't, Paulina? Oh, Melina. Um, you, you, your question was, are there enough affordable units for the amount of people in one socket who are looking for units? Uh, I think it's pretty clear that the more affordable units you have, the more people you attract to your community because they're looking for affordable housing. Uh, The question isn't, uh, do we need affordable housing in the state of Rhode Island? I think the answer to that is yes. Everyone needs to live in a home that is affordable. That's how you succeed in life. But the reality is that one community or a handful of communities should not be carrying the burden of a tax of tax relief uh, and other communities not carrying that burden. Uh, we want everyone to feel that they are welcome in any community in the state of Rhode Island. Any 39 cities and towns should be welcoming everyone, no matter what their gender, color, ethnicity. We should not be putting people in pockets of poverty in urban communities. We should be spreading out the affordable housing throughout the state of Rhode Island so people are feeling welcome, whether they're in rural, urban, or suburban communities. In addition to that, generally the urban communities are the communities that are struggling. So by giving additional 
tax relief in those particular communities, what is happening is the families who are not living in affordable housing, who are just making ends meet, are continually picking up the burden of the relief that, are, that is generally given to uh, individuals who own properties that do not live in our community. So they are getting relief. They are not taxpayers who are uh, residents of the community, generally speaking. And when the tax assessor referred to the, uh, the unit, the 117 units, where they are paying complete taxation, full taxation, and someone comes along and they want to purchase that, but they are looking for the 8% relief. My question is, if the current owner can afford to pay the taxes and maintain the property, then why would we need to move forward and give a tax break to the new buyer? And by doing that, we are now burdening the hardworking families who some are still relying on state services but could potentially push them over the edge. So other than the fact that, and I think Mr. Caldwell probably uh, in his underlying message, uh, hit the target. And that is certain communities are creating regulations and ordinances and laws within their towns to prevent affordable housing. And they do that strategically in order to not have affordable housing within their community. I feel that affordable housing is good in every community. It should be, bur the burden should be, if you want to call it a burden, I think it's great, but diversity it should be across the state of Rhode Island and people shouldn't feel that they cannot live in a suburban community with an affordable house to put them closer to their family or closer to their workplace. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, Amy. Um, I would just uh, thank you also for your presentation, um, very informative. And I would completely agree with the mayor. I think that um, uh, absolutely every state needs, every municipality in the state needs to be doing its part to achieve uh, affordable housing goals, and which was the purpose of the law in the first place, was to try to uh, get some of those communities who had not been producing affordable housing to produce more. Um, and, and I hope that through the work of this commission, it would be the goal to um, figure out ways that the law could be tweaked to um, uh, make sure that that's happening and encourage that to happen. Um, I do have a question for you um, on your presentation around the, um, the example that you gave uh, for the 117 residential unit project. Um, I'm not familiar with this one, mm -hmm. um, and our development team may be uh, familiar with it. Um, I'm getting calls from California on this one. So, <laughs> yeah, but if, is it, are they applying, do they want to create, it's very unusual mm -hmm. in Rhode Island, certainly for a deeply subsidized, uh, it is part of the records that we have. Um, it is a hundred percent subsidized project and it is not receiving the 8% taxation, but a section eight. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, I'm not sure. So are you development that large, mm -hmm to convert to affordable housing right. would generally require like a, like deep subsidy, like yeah. our 9% Section affordable eight. housing tax credits, state state um, historic preservation tax right. credit. I mean, it would be very difficult mm -hmm. for a development of this size to become an affordable development. Um, as, as Melina mentioned, most of the development that happens now, mm -hmm. uh, right, the old Section 8 developments, that's akin to sort of the old Section 8 developments, which... Um, you can't create those anymore. That subsidy doesn't exist anymore. Okay. So most of the development that happens now is much smaller scale. The members of the um, uh, housing network, uh, the nonprofit community, but the for-profits as well tend to be much smaller mm -hmm. um, developments or scra scattered sites. So I, I would be interested, in addition to the information that Annette asked for, I would love to learn more about that project. It's, it's a... It's a um, I'm surprised that I have, we haven't heard anything about something of that scale. That's right. interesting. Thank you, Amy. Any other questions? Yes. Hi, thank you, Elise. Hi. Um, just to follow up a little bit on what Melina and what the mayor had talked about, you know, you had mentioned that there's no reported vacancies for the 8% properties, mm -hmm. and there's 15% vacancy overall for right. so to sort of maybe more get at the the actual need for a for deed restricted affordable across the board in the mm -hmm. socket i'd be interested in knowing um the vacancy rate for deed restricted affordable okay i can get that 
Thank you, Aline. Any Just one, one last comment on the conversation around equitable um, placement of affordable units across the state, which I think we all agree on and we're all on this commission. Um, but especially as representing Grow Smart, I think we all agree too that a special uh, characteristic of Rhode Island is our urban, suburban, exurban divide. Mm -hmm. And so we have very large areas of the state like our foster here, um, with absolutely no public water and sewer. And I know Mr. Caldwell is well aware of these areas too. So I think it's important in moving forward and especially in looking at the Housing Futures look, uh, Guide um, to look at what our villages are within those areas and to think about what the infrastructure that would be needed in order to accommodate that kind of growth in sustainable ways, both for our environment, our village character, and to support the kind of housing that Mr. Caldwell and his colleagues would like to produce, um, both that maybe have deed restrictions and are permanently affordable, but also that middle housing that is sometimes referred to, which is the kind of home I live in, in Eastern Cranston, post-World War II kind of neighborhood, um, you know, kids ride their bikes, things like that. So um, so I just wanted to emphasize that as we do this, it's an opportunity to look at it in a smart way so that we're not, you know, paving over Foster in Charlestown, um, but we are looking at those areas within those places that can support the kind of village housing that we need. Thank you. Any last questions? Yes, Mayor. I would just like to um, draw your attention to page two where it talks about the summary of, requ of the requirements. And I, can, uh, I would like to maybe for the next meeting bring a few more facts regarding a situation uh, regarding a particular building in the city of Woonsocket where the property was not, uh, did not fall under the 8% taxation and the owner of the property applied for 8% taxation. And as you can see in the chart, uh, re requesting a CO issued after 1995, which of course were in 2017, so he met that requirement. Uh, substantial rehab, and you can see the rest, and the recorded uh, rent restrictions. So what this particular owner did was he applied for a CO he paid full taxation, he applied for a CO, and the question became substantial rehab. Substantial rehab is not defined. So substantial rehab is a very um, loose term, and you could potentially go into that particular building and paint, change the carpets, get a CO, have rent restrictions, and now you go from 100% taxation to 8% of the gross rental income. So that substantial rehab is not defined. And in, in my estimation, uh, substantial rehab of a building, and I am not a builder, but substantial rehab is not cosmetic, which to me is more of painting and carpeting. Substantial rehab is when you're tearing down walls and you're getting to studs and you're rewiring and replumbing and doing all of those things. So we took a one, approximately 100 unit building and lost our taxation to an 8% gross rental income. We, we cannot sustain the continuation of the loss of tax revenue in a struggling urban community that has been historically just distressed for decades and continue to give tax breaks that are affecting the middle class and lower uh, income middle class folks. Thank you, Mayor. Just, yep. We'll get that from you, Mayor. Even after this, you can forward that info to Charles, and we'll be able to forward that to the commission as well to be shared. Okay, let's um, thank you, Lise, for your presentation. I appreciate the opportunity you've given us. I would like to have our last presenter from the Central Falls um, Planning Director, Peter, who will present on behalf of Central Falls a little bit of their information. We can go for it.
Hello. There we go. So thank you to the commission for having me here today. I do not have a visual presentation. I have uh, some notes I've taken that will uh, formulate the testimony I'm going to give today. So I'm here to talk about low and moderate income housing from the perspective of Central Falls. Central Falls has the lowest median income, the lowest home prices, and the lowest rents of any municipality in the state, but we have the highest percentage of cost burdened households, both renters and homeowners in the state. I think that is somewhat of an incredible feat um, that we have the lowest incomes and also we have the uh, people that are suffering most um, trying to afford, I'm sorry, the lowest home prices and the people suffering the most trying to afford those homes. So this um, unique situation that we're in has created this uh, cycle that Central Falls has been in for uh, about half a century now um, where we're associated with being an impoverished city and because of that we're not attracting much of the investment that other places in Rhode Island are. Central Falls at this point, uh, having just come out of bankruptcy, is at a unique moment. We have leadership radiating from the city and um, we're working to address these systemic issues that are affecting our city. I would argue that affordable housing is largely an income-related issue. If everyone had enough income to afford their homes, we wouldn't need affordable housing. So I think one way to address this issue is to raise incomes. Uh, I know that that's not always possible, particularly when a lot of that um, legislation is coming from the federal level. If we're going to uh, be addressing f home ownership from a grant perspective, um, the enormity of the problem is incredibly difficult to overcome, and I, I frankly don't think that we're providing an adequate level of investment to su sufficiently address the issues. So there are some ways to kind of beat the system, and that's where we've tried to focus our efforts in Central Falls. Our primary effort has been increasing home ownership. We're right around a quarter of our properties in the city being occupied by their owners. The state average is 60%. There's been national research done that streets that with high levels of home ownership have lower rates of crime, they have uh, higher home values, and that's the approach that we're taking in Central Falls. Um, our initiative, our, our, our goal for the city, our, our path forward to seek improvement in our community and to continue to support our basic city services is to attract and retain middle income residents. Uh, we think that is the backbone of any uh, economy and that's what will allow our city to thrive. So one of the uh, other aspects of that is we want to maintain our low income residents. We want to continue to support them, continue to provide them services. And we've targeted our investments to attract and maintain middle income residents in a strategic manner to limit any impacts on low income residents. The city is committed to meeting all state goals and requirements for affordable housing. We are currently one of the few communities in the state that does so. And I would point out to the commission that if you look at the list of municipalities that are meeting the affordable housing goal for the state, there's a lot of overlap between that and the distressed communities list in the city. So I will uh, point out to the comments we received, the commission received uh, from Woonsocket, uh, both from the presenter and from Mayor Baldelli Hunt about the issue and um, how difficult that is. In Central Falls, um, we have focused a lot of our affordable housing development efforts on rehabbing and tearing, demolishing and rebuilding uh, homes that have reached their the end of their useful life. I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Um, we were primarily funding that through community development block grants awarded through the state of Rhode Island from the Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development. 
there was a shift in rulemaking from HUD last year, and they determined that we were no longer able to receive uh, federal grant dollars to support affordable housing construction in this manner, and that has been a serious blow to the efforts in our city to construct affordable housing. We have not built any affordable units since this uh, ruling came down last year. So that fact I presented at the beginning of my testimony is from the Housing Works report done in 2015, which is, a, I think, a fantastic analysis of the current state of housing in Rhode Island. It also pointed out that there is a serious shortage of housing units in the state, and I would argue uh, that the testimony from Mr. Caldwell is a good analysis of why that uh, shortage exists and that this is probably a significant factor in Rhode Island's population exodus that it will very likely lead to a reduction in the number of representatives that we send to the United States Congress. Coming back to housing, talking specifically about the efforts that Central Falls has undertaken, uh, we've developed a series of um, initiative to address this issue. One of our primary uh, efforts has been our nuisance task force. This is an interdepartment uh, gathering to focus on problem properties and addressing issues that result in blight on our community and reduce the quality of life of our city. We've focused on about 100 properties in the task force's three or four year existence. One of our uh, big struggles has been that uh, with some of these properties, we're dealing with absentee landlords, we're dealing with people that live in Florida, and we don't believe that the tools that we have uh, to attract the attention of these property owners are sufficient. One of our critical issues is that our municipality is limited to a $500 fine uh, to levy uh, in any circumstance. I believe that this was, limit was put in place by the legislature in the early 1990s. That was over 25 years ago. If you were looking simply at how at inflation, that fine should be $1,000. Uh, but that doesn't at all address the issue of attracting the attention of people that aren't invested in these properties, including large banks. And I think that in certain circumstances for non-homeowner occupied properties, the legislature needs to authorize communities to address serious fines uh, to these properties so that we're holding these property owners accountable for the, you know, the blight that they're uh, sending our communities. Another program that we've used is receivership. This has worked very well, although it does not work in all circumstances. Uh, the court process is slow, and due to the legislation enacted uh, a few years ago, the so-called Madeline Walker Act, uh, it results in properties that are vacant and boarded and in a deteriorating state uh, for up to a period of five or six years. So I'm going to talk now a little bit about our strategy for investing in individual properties. We focus on properties that have reached a state where they're no longer habitable. So we're not directly displacing residents. We're not buying up properties and, and forcing people out. We're focusing on strategic investments in vacant property, reintroducing them to our tax rolls, and providing new opportunities for people to reside within our community. Um, these properties are identified as vacant. They're, they move through our nuisance program. They move through receivership. One of our critical tools, again, is the CDBG funding. So that has also stalled our ability to work through these properties. Other initiatives include working with our housing authority on the family self-sufficiency self program that has seen um, some fantastic results. They were recognized nationally for, nationally for that. We've worked with our local CDC, PCF Development, 
we're very proud to have Ms. Weislinger on the commission here. Um, in addition to previously uh, new affordable housing construction, we've established a home buyer education course and we have a municipal clothing cost assistance program. We have partnered with the Housing Network on a tenant education program and we're working with our local community action program, PIFCAP, on a home repair program that will keep properties habitable. So this allows for our, our existing low and in moderate income residents to stay in their homes. And one of the things that we've noticed is when these properties get to, you know, the receivership status, they were properties that were previously habitated and those people are no longer living those in those homes. They've had to find alternative means of residence and there's a significant investment by the city anywhere from fifty to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars to bring these properties back into use so to the extent that we can keep people in their homes that we can keep these properties contributing to our tax rolls i think that's to the betterment of our city and our communities in general so there's two final points i want to make to summarize the first is that there is a gap between what it costs to construct a home and what it caught and what you can sell that home for in the state of Rhode Island. We need to find methods to fund this adequately. And the second is that I would argue uh, in agreement with the city of Woonsocket that communities like ours are suffering, suffering the burden of, of meeting the, of adequately meeting the goals set by the state of Rhode Island for affordable housing. We're very proud to have affordable housing, we're proud to have a diverse uh, diversity of incomes within our community, but this needs to be shared by other communities. Other communities um, have low and moderate income people living in them, they have low and moderate people working in them, and there needs to be opportunities for people uh, on a much larger scale to live within these communities. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Do you have any questions? Any questions? Yes, Amy. A quick question. The 500 um, limit that you talked about, is that the non-utilization tax or do, what is the statute? No, that's you separate. Know? Huh? Separate from the non-utilization tax. So what, do you know what under what statute that $500 cap is? So one I was looking at earlier today is our municipal court system, but there's also um, a, a city a civil infraction that is limited to five hundred dollars. Is that a municipal restriction or is it a stat state, state restriction. statutory? State statutory. That would be interesting to know as well. What that? I don't know. And I believe that's for every municipality in the state. We can get Lim that information for you to too. Maybe we can gather that from the Peter or Charles can. We can uh, representative. I have a question for both of you. Elise, could you come to the table, well, please? The issue with banks and foreclosures, and um, I know you see it, banks are not recording the foreclosures in the appropriate amount of time, and they seem like they'd much rather pay the fine than record the foreclosure. Do you see that as an issue with affordable housing? And All the time. <laughs> um, there was a property recently that the bank claims that they foreclosed on two years ago, but it still remains in the, it's an elderly woman's name. Um, I don't know the reason. Each bank has their own reason as to why they keep the bank in the owner's name, not their name. Um, but they keep paying the taxes, they turn off the water, and it sits there for two years. And you, I mean, there's a phone number on the house where property management, you know, call this company, you call that number. Oh, we haven't managed that property in nine months. Call, call back the bank. You call the bank, you can't get through to anybody. So it is a huge problem. Um, but you send a bill, it gets paid. Um, but again, it's not addressing the actual problem, which is a vacant boarded property in your city that every neighbor calls and complains about every two months. So. Uh, to go off of what Elise said, uh, I think we would be much happier if they weren't paying and we could take the property through tax title. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> That's good. Any other questions? Yes, Mayor. <clears throat> 
So the fact that the fine is so low for not recording the owner, for not recording the bank as the owner and a contact, I believe Rhode Island general law mandates that when a bank takes back the property that they need to record ownership, record contact information, and the fact that the fine is so low, uh, they would prefer to pay the, and I'm, I guess this is a question even though it sounds like a statement, uh, is it true that they prefer to pay the fine as opposed to recording ownership and contact information because the fine is so low they, they'd rather just not be contacted by that municipality. Um, I've seen in numerous closings now in, in the city of Woonsocket where um, the bank comes forward and the, the same day that they have a new buyer lined up, they're recording the deeds to foreclose, they're paying whatever fines, everything's cleared up and here's the house that's yours now that bank owned the property for all of 12 minutes while they were recording the documents. Um, so who, the legal ownership maintained, you know, stayed in the old lady's name for how many years. Um, and yeah, we'll just pay the fee at the end. I think it's, like you said, it's a very small fee. Um, and they'd rather pay that fee than assume the liability for, you know, a vacant property for three years. Thank you, Elise. Yes, Representative. One last question. I'm not sure if we're getting off topic, but in that case of the elderly woman, that's not been in that house, but it's been in her name. The city of Unzak, the city is sending her a tax bill with possibly a homestead exemption. Not receiving the homestead exemption. Okay. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Amy. Uh, not a question, but a comment. One of the things that Peter mentioned was the Madeline Walker Act. Um, so I would just like to to. Um, mention that um, there is a provision under the Madeline Walker Act, which obviously Rhode Island Housing plays a role um, in implementing, uh, that requires Rhode Island Housing to hold prop liens, hold properties whose liens we have purchased um, for five years compared to one year for um, private investors. And where this has become an issue, and I know that Central Falls has, has run into this, as have other uh, urban areas, um, Sometimes after we purchase the lien, uh, the property is vacated, the, the owner leaves, um, and uh, because of those provisions of the law, we are not able to foreclose on, on that lien. Um, we did try, we've tried a number of times to have that um, statute change to uh, allow in the cases of um, vacant or abandoned properties or non housing to foreclose in one year and have not so far been successful. However, if the commission would like to make that recommendation again, we would certainly support it. Thank you, Amy. Any more questions? Okay. Well, thank you guys both thank you. for giving this information. Um, I just want to add, we had some really great conversations today. I just want to keep in mind that in the next meeting, I do plan to have the towns and cities that have not met the 10% and what are their struggles attaining that goal. Um, so in the next meeting, we will have presenters come before us where we could sort of prepare and um, ask the questions and hopefully get the answers that we need to move forward. Can I make a request? Yes. When you are doing that, could you ask some of the uh, leaders of the cities that actually are within what is termed the urban services boundary, so our larger municipalities, like Warwick, like Cranston. Um, yes. Thank you. Thank yes, you. we'll keep that in mind. We'll take note of that. And um, again, your recommendations are always welcome. So please forward that to us. And so the next are our, our meeting dates. As you notice, are scheduled. We are scheduled two dates. We have February sixteenth at three p.m. and March fourteenth at three p.m. At this time, I'd like to adjourn. We can have a motion. Motion to adjourn. Second? Second? Yes. Thank you, guys.